So I get the opportunity to introduce Dr. Kalita Shetty and research scientist Dr. Sakar from NDSU. Dr. Shetty is the director of the Global Institute of Food Security and International Agriculture at NDSU, along with Dr. Sakar. And the mission of the Institute is to advance solutions to global food security challenges through a paradigm shift in building climate resilient food systems and a food for health model as a value added agriculture platform to combat climate change and global health challenges. Simple stuff, right? So we're very excited to hear more about this research and the role of indoor agriculture in their efforts. So would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Shetty and Dr. Sakar. We have 14 slides and through these 14 slides, I'll present about nine slides within five, six minutes uh, to articulate for you uh, what are these global challenges and why Eden Grow System and Indo agriculture is important? So I'll keep it very specific and focused. So uh, if you look at uh, the current uh, world challenges, you see really that most of the world, 80% of the world is fed by close to 500 million small farmers with less than one hectare of land. Okay, so that's where the world is fed. And number two, the large agriculture above 500 hectares feeds another 20%. And therefore, uh, these two models are from uh, domesticated agriculture, which mainly use about 10 to 15 species for most of our 90% of our species uh, for our food. Uh, this is not sustainable. This is not healthy. And, and I'll tell you why. So this needs a third dimension, and that's the indoor agriculture. So that's where I think this innovation in uh, indoor agriculture that Eden has is remarkable, because it does decentralize and gives the individual the opportunity. And when you look at this, uh, currently, where is the world? We are a population of 7.5 billion on the planet, and by 2050, we are projected to be uh, around uh, 9 billion, and by end of the century, about 10, 10 and a half billion. The, it's plateauing. But currently, we produce enough calories for 12 billion people. We produce enough calories for 12 billion people for, for a population that's 7.4. So while we have 1 billion people still hungry that need uh, calorie nourishment, uh, from macronutrients and micronutrients, we have 2 billion people going towards comorbidity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So that is the world we are living in. And this shift happened in year 2000, where this second dimension of food security emerged, is we are more people going towards comorbidity burden. And therefore, we have to address both these challenges with climate change in front of us. And the fourth dimension is many of the antidotes uh, that we do not consume enough. For example, an average American consumes less than one serving of fruits and vegetables per day. We should be having seven to nine servings, and it's perishable. And so with these dimensions, the preservation of food, localization of food is very important. Without that, we cannot fight both malnourishment that's around the world, but also the comorbidity burdens. So with that in mind, if you see today, we have 1 billion hungry, 2 billion facing the comorbidity risk. So our whole food system is collapsed. So we need a very rigorous food for health paradigm where the it's not just macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, and minerals, and vitamins. There are overall whole food components that are necessary that needs to come from a wider array and wider array of fresh food and whole food systems. Because a lot of the good things that can fight these comorbidities are hidden, which we stripped away, or we use a narrow choice of few number of crops to feed ourselves. So with this, this whole uh, hunger, undernourishment, and overbalanced system is the world we are living in as the population moves to 9 billion by 2050. And we have abundance of calories from our agriculture. Therefore, current agriculture is necessary, but we need to improve it and add new dimensions to it. And Indo agriculture is one of them. And then if you see really, there's another big. So if you see, COVID has taught us the biggest lesson that this paradigm is a failure. That means our current food paradigm is a failure. And if you see the two years data of uh, comorbidity links, you can see susceptibility to COVID was highest where the comorbidity risk was high. Now, the data is still emerging. There's a data coming out of Asia, 
you can see a direct correlation where the comorbidity risks were higher, urban environments, uh, especially Latin America, urban environments, the COVID susceptibility is higher. This is very uh, natural because innate immunity is a foundation comes from uh, nutrition. It's not just vaccine. Vaccines and medicines, they're all important when the, di when the disease comes. But overall health is nourished by our nutrition. Our nutrition is imperfect. And you can see this, COVID has taught us that, those lessons. So the burden of COVID has an underlying food security, food insecurity, nutritional insecurity burden. And you're going to see those data coming uh, as we move. And therefore, another important aspect is this is going to only get worse. And the reason is we are going to live already by 2030, 55% of the world population is going to live in urban dense environments. And this is only going to get worse by 2050, even 60, more than 60% are going to live in urban environments. And therefore, you need this third dimension of agriculture, which is the Indo agriculture, okay, on a health targeted, climate resilient model. And this needs to then integrate both the large agriculture and also the 500 million small farmers who feed us, right? They feed 80% of us right, on the planet as a, as a whole. And so all of this needs to work in harmony. Nothing should be kept out because all have its strength, but we can imp improve them to face the climate change we are em that's emerging and also the health system that has collapsed and COVID has exposed it. So with that in mind, Eden, I think, is a very important part of the third dimension of indoor agriculture. And this can provide year-round production uh, improve access. Uh, it does not require major resources, as uh, uh, Jeff has uh, e elegantly highlighted. Reduction in carbon foot footprint. We can diversify the choices we have uh, of what we grow. We can have even culturally relevant uh, diversification in every domain across the world. In fact, today about 15, 14 to 15 of our international partners have joined us and watching us on uh, uh, over the net. Uh, and then we can further design it for a local, uh, you know, aligned uh, value-added food systems. And so this diversification has many facets, especially in this globally urbanized environment where majority of us are going to live. Okay? So with this uh, perspective, um, we think uh, this has a high potential. And I will let uh, Dipayan articulate uh, some of that further. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiji. So we uh, strongly, like uh, from our research and our education and collaboration, we focus on the two key concepts of diversity and resilience across the food system or food chain. So we believe that, you know, with this Eden Grow system, and I'm very excited. I was, when I was meeting Bart uh, a year ago and then Jeff, and we are working with this because last four or five years, we are working with microgreen, micro arb, mi micro seedlings, and how to build this resilience across food chain. So we believe this, this can be targeted for high value mother plants, like building, like if you have a targeted, because there are many differences or variations among the plant species or when you have a cross-pollinated different medicinal plants or other. So you can pick or choose which has the higher bioactive or better health benefits. And we can keep this kind of this system that mother plants or can be produced for the optimized, you know, the transplant shock recovery. Because here, uh, Jack is here and uh, sh he works with the community garden and the transplanting is a big part in the spring and how to build that optimization or resiliency. And it can be also targeted for food deserts as Jeff and Bart uh, mentioned, and also to edu educate communities and, you know, the societies as large. So as a whole, our concept is to build a network. So like this, you know, Grand Farm uh, with the Eden Grow system, NDSU and MSUM, like others, all the community researchers and as a whole, if we can build a collaboration and partnership to educate people, to bring awareness, provide training to students, 
And this, can be, this model can be very sustainable and can be a very effective way to teach the communities or even students. And it can give even opportunity for business to grow more job creation or other in rural or urban agriculture. Uh, I was working with a couple of microgreen growers here at Fargo, and after COVID, many of them were out of business. You know, there was a lot of strain with the economic strain. And this kind of system can bring, you know, back those, you know, revitalize uh, the growing and other of the innovation system for business and rural agriculture. So as we're talking about diversity and resilience, it is important to understand di diversity across food chain. How can we bring in more crop diversity? So that we are fortunate in North Dakota, we have 45 or around more than 40 crops, but it's need to be diversified as a whole in urban and rural settings. And this uh, Eden Grow system or this tower system can bring this more diversification of agriculture. And we have to understand another important part of microbial diversity because microbe is a key part, the beneficial microbe across the soil rhizosphere to plant phylosphere to our human health and whole food chain. This improving the microbial diversity is very important and that provides the nutritional diversity which is needed for this balanced nutrition to protect our health, improve our health and well-being. So this whole diversity together coming from ecological biodiversity improve the resilience, resilience across the food chain and human health. And this is where I just, this is just a visual aid to bring this whole rhizosphere, plant system, soil system and human health. And there is an equilibrium, there is a harmony. And if we improve across this all critical point and chain, it only gives us more resilient and robust system and that can provide the, and advance the food security or public health solutions. So we do research with uh, a metabolic, I will not explain a lot of this, but what we target is, is in the plant. Plant is a very unique system and as an autotroph, they produce the food for us. We are all depend on the plant, but the same plant also they are sessile and they cannot move. So they have their own protective system to tolerate the environment, if environmental different changes, also to insect and pest. So plant is very like elegant system. They have their own protection. And those protective compounds, so we study the metabolic regulation of plant and whether we can target or improve tools or design system like this, where can be, that can be, you know, we can tweak the system to improve those bioactives or stress relevant phytochemicals, which is important for plant to tolerate stress, but also important for us when we consume the food to protect against the diseases because all come from that oxygen malfunction because we are in oxygen dependent system. So whether the chronic disease Dr. Shetty talked about or plant stress, they are all related to this oxygen and how to, how to manage this oxygen, whether through breathing or plants through the respiration. And these all compounds provide that protection to, and build more resilience across food chain. So I will just, the last slide, I, as I talked, we, we are working with this microgreen, micro seedlings, micro herbs, and this system of the Zidane Grow gives us really opportunity to optimize and improve this kind of research and study where we can even integrate the beneficial microbes or microbiome to improve the resilience and robustness. Okay, thank you. I'll be glad to answer any question. And this is our institute. And Talking about the opportunities that exist through collaboration with different organizations, corporate, the startups, the university, the growers. Talk about, this is almost becoming kind of that perfect marriage between university research, partnering with a, a startup venture, creating com, uh, community and public in, involvement. I guess talk about kind of how you see this forming in the university role. Oh, uh, yeah, this is, this is very exciting. Uh, I think there is a whole new uh, uh, platform for innovation. So we like to take our core technologies and sort of uh, whole, have the spin-off that can engage with the community. So we are uh, trying to sort of cohesively take all our core technology of the last 30 years we have worked on and to see how this can be the foundation of sustainable technologies from the food security to health across the value chain and then work with as needed with like Eden system is one of them. So there could be other Jack's uh, organizations, the other. It doesn't matter whether it's for profit or uh, 
community gardens or uh, any any social enterprises it doesn't matter so we then start e engaging and bringing the university technologies because uh, we have opportunity to look at the deeper side of uh, these uh, plant microbial metabolic systems uh, or deeper systems and that can be sort of translated as the demand for you know utility emerges and they drive the utility and we can align with them sure well, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shetty and Dr. Sakar. You're doing great work. Let's hear it out for you. Okay. And when you look at the technology that is often derived in um, indoor agriculture, it's often derived from NASA and space technology. I believe that Jeff can tell you a little bit more about how this is derived from NASA technology. But not only is he a space agriculture expert, he's also an indoor agriculture expert, and he's here right now. So, Dr. Gary, uh, the floor is yours. It's good to be back here in Fargo. The first time I've actually been up here about 2014 with Dr. Shetty's Institute looking at food, food and agriculture and food security. And, and what I, my background is I'm a horticulturist, I'm a plant physiologist, I'm a space biologist. I have uh, originally started growing apple peaches, plums, somehow ended up growing plants on the International Space Station and spent a better part of my career figuring out how I could keep four people alive on a mission to Moon and Mars. And about five years ago, stepped down from that to start consulting on how I could apply that to feed those four billion people that are coming to Earth on this planet. And at the Space Agriculture Conference hosted here at Grand Farms and Emerging Prairie, met Bard and company, and had been retained by them to help them on some of their agriculture experiments. And a lot of this technology, the lighting emitting diodes, was first introduced by, by NASA that has enabled this to happen. And it wasn't to make a better light, it was to make sure that when you touched it, you didn't burn yourself. Like you do if you hit a light bulb, it was so it didn't break and astronauts end up with glass going in their eyes and you didn't have to replace it and take a lot of spares. So what this technology does in terms of its aeroponics and its lights and its remoting is taking that ethos of NASA, of going to the moon or Mars, you have to have reliability, you have to have efficiency, you have to have sustainability. And those are the things that need to be able to get re remotely to ensure self and safety. And to follow up on what Dr. Sh Shetty and Dr. Sekar were saying, what this is ideal for is maybe not producing the calories. The last time I was up here at, you know, in, in August, I drove a hundred miles and saw some of the richest farmland in America growing calories. But what I did not see is growing the bioprotectants, the nutrients, the things that give that, that health and safety that are going through, through that diet. So this is what enables those comorbidities, as was mentioned, you know, the diseases that health, increase your vigor of your system so you can put up a better fight. And that better fight comes from those phytoprotectants, but those are the colors, the reds, the oranges, the greens, that we are able to now grow at the site. So this is taking your food and health and allowing you and an individual and a community or a family to take their health to them, take responsibility back through that diet. Food is indeed our medicine, and this is a tool to let that medicine be produced locally in communities and in homes pretty much anywhere on the planet. So I am delighted to be here, happy to see that this time is coming. This is my first time, just as a complete aside, to, to be up in Fargo the best time of the year. <laughs> this is ideal because as I did that drive from, from Grand Forks at that 100 miles, that last August was some of the most productive farmland in, in America. I saw rows and rows of snow mounded up and not a thing growing. But what this enables is instead of being dependent upon that transport up that highway, which I'm super glad was clear, you can grow it here. So once again, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for bringing this together. And those events like the Space Ag enabled me to meet Bart. It allowed me to re get introduced to Shetty and it brought them together. So now we're all gathered here in a period of short eight months because of this ecosystem that's being supported. So thank you very much and I'm glad to be here. Thank you.